Well, good morning, church. It's great to see you folks here and have you join us today on this Sunday. Uh, we are taking a break from our time in Romans, journeying through Romans together. We'll be starting that up in several weeks, but in the upcoming weeks, we have a whole bunch of um, standalone topical sermons that you'll be greatly blessed to check in on. And so it's great to have you folks here today. I'm Pastor Ed. I'm one of the um, pastors here at um, Hillside and Lifesong Church. And um, it's awesome to have you folks join us today. Today we'll be looking at the question, what kind of faith does Jesus re respond to? What is the kind of faith that Jesus responds to? And um, as we do that, um, we are going to be asking questions and looking at some passages in Mark that speak specifically to that. There's a, a whole bunch of passages that speak to that effect, but we're going to be looking at two specifically um, from Mark today. And, and when I talk about faith, I'm not talking about a saving faith. I, I'm not talking about um, what kind of prayers does Jesus um, respond to to save us, to give us his salvation. Um, if you're thinking about that and you're wondering about that question, I invite you to turn into, tune into our Lifesong CC channel and check out a service, a sermon that was preached a couple weeks ago by Pastor Mark. And there he talks about the kind of knowledge we need, the kind of agreement we need to come to, and the kind of trust that we have to place our faith in um, to have saving faith. So we're not talking about that kind of faith. Today we're talking about the kind of faith that God requires of, of us, that the kind of faith that He responds to in regards to how we believe in Him, um, how we trust Him, the, the kind of posture that we need to have um, to, to place our faith in God and approach Him um, so that He will be more likely to respond. Um, see, we, there's places in Scripture that talks about a faith that... Um, Jesus doesn't respond to, uh, a faith that is self-serving, uh, uh, a faith that asks because of impure motives, right? Uh, a faith that is um, selfishly um, centered, and um, a faith that says, hey, if I do this, then, then you'll do this, right, God? That's not the kind of faith that, that God responds to, that Jesus responds to. And so today we're going to look at the posture um, from these two passages in chapter 7 of Mark, of um, some ways that we can approach God and um, see that he responds to us when we approach him with that kind of faith. And so the first place that informs us of this kind of faith is found in Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 30. So turn with me in your smartphones or your electronic Bibles or even your old Bibles, your hard copy Bibles, and follow along as I read. Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 30, says this, Then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre. He didn't want anyone to know which house he was staying in, but he couldn't keep it a secret. Right away, a woman who had heard about him came and fell at his feet. Her little girl was possessed by an evil spirit, and she begged him to cast out the demon from her daughter. Since she was a Gentile born in Syrian Phoenicia, he goes on to say, <clears throat> Jesus told her, hey, first I should feed the children, my own family, the Jews. It isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. She replied, that's true, Lord. But even the dogs under the table are allowed to eat the scraps from the children's plate. Good answer, he said. Now go home, for the demon has left your daughter. And when she arrived home, she found her little girl lying quietly in bed and the demon was gone. And so you see here, here is the first um, element or one of the first pieces um, that we should have um, in our faith, in believing in Jesus, um, that, that makes it more likely for him to respond to us, right? And, and this is what it is. It is this. One of the kinds of faith that Jesus responds to is a humble and desperate kind of faith. A humble and desperate kind of faith. Um, we see that this woman here, she is humble. Um, and we see this from these specific verses. Um, when, when Jesus is asked by her to heal her demon-possessed daughter, he says, first, first I should feed the children of my own family, the Jews. It, it isn't right for me to take food, to take time from them, to take time teaching them and ministering to them. Uh, it's not right to take them... Take that away from them first because they are my first call, Jesus says. He comes first to save the people of the Jewish nation, right? Um, so it isn't right 
to take that attention away from them and then to throw it to the dogs. And then she replies, that's true, Lord. But even the dogs under the table are allowed to eat the scraps from the children's plate. Good answer, he says. Now go home, for the demon has left your daughter. Right? And so in those words there, that's true. But even the dogs under the table are allowed to eat from the children's plates. Um, we see that there is a sense of humility there. Now that term dog there, it's not, it's not derogatory. I know some of us might be thinking like, whoa, Jesus. Uh, hey, don't pull punches with her now. Um, you know, what, what he's really using there is not a derogatory term. There's a, a, a Jewish term that um, was used for dogs that was more derogatory that, that, um, that, that, that meant um, mangly dog, like a mangy dog, like um, feral dogs. And, and that's a term that the Jews would often use of the Gentiles because they thought they were impure and unclean, right? But that's not, that's not the word that Jesus used here. And he could have, but he doesn't. Instead, what he does is this. He uses um, a more, a more uh, loving term, a more endearing term. Well, the term he uses there is kind of like equivalent to our, um, our term today called um, fur puppies. Fur, fur babies. Fur babies, right? And, um, and, and there's almost like a play on words here. Like, like he's saying, like, hey, I shouldn't let any of the fur puppies, um, those that I love, and still... Um, want to save and still want to bless and still want to respond to their faith when they come and, and ask me for things. Um, first, it goes to the Jews, but, but there's a place for you folks, but it's just not now. It's just not now. And she gets it. She gets it. She goes like, yeah, I know. I know we're just fur. I know we're not, we're not children, children. We're not the first mission, the first people that you know, you've come to save, your first priority. Um, but but we're still fur babies, right? We, we we get to get some of the scraps, right? And 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 Jesus almost like with a wink in her eye, his eye kind of like yeah, you get it, you get it, right? I respond to that faith. I respond. I respond because because of your humility, because you understand. And, and what we see in her humility is this: that that she doesn't demand, she doesn't expect, she doesn't feel entitled. But she knows her place as one of the creation, that, that, that Jesus and God is the creator, that they have the authority and they have all the dignity. And we come, we come humbled. We come knowing, knowing this, that God owes us nothing. God owes us nothing, right? That, that we, we really deserve his judgment. We, we, deserve, we deserve his wrath. Um, that's what we deserve. But she comes humbly. And she comes knowing that he is compassionate. That he is compassionate. We, we see his compassion, um, Jesus' compassion throughout the scriptures. That he leaves the 99 to go and find the one who is lost. The one who has strayed away. He is a compassionate God. Um, he sees us tired and worn out. Burned out. Trying to work hard enough. Trying to be good enough. Um following a whole bunch of religious rules that, that the religious leaders had put upon them above and beyond what God has asked. And he sees, he sees us spiritually lost and without direction. And he has compassion on us. And so she comes in a humble posture, in a humble manner, um, appealing to his compassion. And he responds. He responds. Here's another thing we see about her approach to Jesus that is shown is that it is a desperate kind of faith, a desperate kind of faith. And in verse 25, we see this right away. A woman who had heard about him right away comes to him and falls at his feet. There's that humility piece again. And then she says this, her, it tells us this, it tells us that her little girl was possessed by an evil spirit and she begged him to cast out the demon from her daughter. She comes with this huge ask and request. We see that the woman is desperate. She's in over her head. And she knows that she's in and over her head. And there is nothing in and of herself that she can do to fix the situation, to help her daughter's need. And so she desperately goes to the one 
that she knows is able to. Up to this point, Jesus has been casting out demons and healing people and bringing, bringing fixes, bringing answers to the prayers that people have brought, whether it be physical ailments, ailments, diseases. Um, God has been able to work through Jesus Christ to bring about these healings. And so this is what she does. She knows she's above um, her her pay grade. She, she knows that she cannot take care of this. And she goes to the one believingly and humbly to the one who is compassionate, who she knows doesn't owe us anything, but at the same time, who is all powerful. He is all powerful. Nothing is too difficult for him. Friends, there are times when your circumstances and mine, they awaken us in us this realization that this situation in our life this sin this hold up this hang up this habit that we have we cannot in and of ourselves beat it there is just no way to do it it is of a spiritual nature that has you and i in bondage and we cannot muster enough strength in ourselves to defeat it it could be a lying issue or an anger issue or a gambling issue. It could be an issue with pornography or greed or unfaithfulness. Um, it could be depression or codependency. Nonetheless, it is a spiritual condition that you and I cannot overcome. No discipline will beat it. No regimen on our part can overcome it. And you and I find ourselves desperate. Desperate. And when we turn to the Lord in our desperateness, acknowledging that we cannot but he can. Jesus is likely to respond. Jesus is likely to respond. Um, and that's what she does. There's a desperateness there. You know, on Tuesday nights at our church, there's this thing called Celebrate Recovery. And I invite you to check it out. It's a fairly new ministry that started up um, in the beginning of the year. And really, it's a ministry for people who are broken. And we all are broken in some way. We all have some kind of hurt that has wounded us so deeply that we cannot overcome it in and of ourselves. We, we might have some habits that we just cannot loose from ourselves or some hangups that we just cannot, we cannot beat. And this is a place where I've seen people, for the lack of better words, delivered, delivered. And the reason why they're delivered is because of this. They come desperately. They come acknowledging that that nothing in and of themselves can beat this thing. And they need God, and they need to come to Him with a desperate spirit, and God heals them. God breaks those shackles. God liberates them and makes them free. Friends, oftentimes we try to muster up our own power, the ability to overcome these things that only Christ and His Holy Spirit can defeat and overcome for us. Sometimes it's like being in a storm and we're, we're rowing, rowing as hard as we can. And we need a force bigger than us. We need the Holy Spirit to work on our behalf because we cannot do it ourselves. We need something that is bigger than that hang up there, that spiritual issue that we're in that binds us um, to free us from that. And so I invite you to come out to that on Tuesday nights. Check it out. Check it out. Um, I know I've been ministered to by it. I believe you will be ministered to as well. And so here's some applications. Check out, celebrate recovery. But at the same time, um, ask yourself this. Um, do I come to God with an attitude of, you owe me? Or do I come humbly? Do I come with the attitude of like, hey, I've got a perfect perfect church attendance ever since I started following you. And so God, you kind of owe me. Or do you come with that attitude of, God, you owe me nothing. And, and in fact, what I'm owed is your wrath. What I'm owed is your judgment. But I know you're compassionate. And I know you are merciful. And I know that you are all powerful. And it's on that, on it's, it's on that, that knowledge that I come. Second thing, um, we see that there's another kind of faith that Jesus responds to, and that's found in the next following passages in verses 31 to 36. So 
turn in your Bible, then you can read along with me here on the screen or on your own devices. It says this, Jesus left Tyre and went up to Sidon before going back to the Sea of Galilee and the region of the Ten Towns. A deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him, and the people begged Jesus to lay his hands on the man to heal him. Jesus led him away from the crowd so they could be alone. He put his fingers into the man's ears. It goes on to say, Then spitting on his own fingers, he touched the man's tongue. Looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Eph Fata, which means be opened. Instantly, the man could hear perfectly and his tongue was freed so he could speak plainly. Jesus told the crowd not to tell anyone, but the more he told them not to, the more they spread the news. And here's what we see uh, is another kind of faith that Jesus responds to. Here's another kind of faith that Jesus bends his ear toward. And it's this, a faith that stands in the gap for others. A faith that lovingly stands in the gap for others. Here's what it says. A deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him. And the people begged Jesus to lay his hands on the man to heal him. The deaf man doesn't come by himself. The deaf man doesn't even come, it seems, from this passage on his own faith. He doesn't come. But, but people who believe in Jesus bring the man to Jesus. People who believe in Jesus and his ability to overcome illnesses and disease... Um, they bring this person to Jesus and help connect him to the all-powerful, compassionate, merciful God. And Jesus lays his hands on him and, and heals him. Um, and, and we shouldn't be surprised because Jesus does this numerous times in the gospel. In Mark 2, we see four friends, four crazy friends. Um, and what they do is they bring a paralyzed man um, and, and they will not be denied. Um, they break through the neighbor's roof and lower him down. And it's because of their faith in Jesus and bringing their friend to that Jesus that this person is healed. That Jesus responds to their faith. Um, not the paralyzed person's faith, but their faith in him. We see this in the centurion serpent. He, he asks um, Jesus to come visit his son. Right? Um, he asks on behalf of his servant. Um, we see this even in the woman in the previous passage. She stands in the gap for her daughter who cannot come to Jesus herself because of her condition of being demon possessed. And, and so here's the question for us, church. Who is the Lord asking you to stand in the gap for? Who, who can you exercise faith for, for another person and stand in the gap for them, bridging that distance between them and Jesus, introducing them to Jesus? The one who can heal. The one who can make their souls whole. How can you and I point them to Jesus? You see, your faith in Jesus and in pointing them to him and helping them to place their faith in Jesus helps them. Helps them to come to know God. And, and, and here's how it works in scripture. John the Baptist points two of his disciples um, who aren't even really looking for Jesus um, and these disciples are probably Andrew and John. And he tells them, look, there Jesus is, the Lamb of God, come to take away the sins of the world. And the result, they follow Jesus. Then Andrew stands in the gap. He tells Simon Peter, his brother, about Jesus. He brings Simon Peter to Jesus. Um, Jesus finds Philip, and, and, and then Philip tells him, follow me. And then Philip, what does he do? He goes and he finds Nathaniel. And he bridges the gap for Nathaniel. And even though Nathaniel was skeptical, Philip just replies, hey, just come and see. Come and see. Come with us. And so Nathaniel comes and sees that he ends up meeting with Jesus. And their lives are drastically changed because they have come into connection with the Savior. And this is what these friends do. They... They take the deaf man and say, hey, come, come and see. Come and see. Let, we'll bring you there. We'll bring, bring you there. And they stand in the gap with their faith for that person. And here's the application I believe for us in that regard is this. Uh, are you and I standing in the gap for our family and friends? Are we bringing our friends and family, the people that we know, to Jesus? Who, who are we inviting to church? 
Who are we sharing the gospel with? Who are we having conversations with that move them closer and closer to Jesus' healing touch and his forgiveness? Who are we bringing to church? And who are we praying for? And, and are we witnessing to others the mighty deeds that God is doing in our midst to help them connect with Jesus? So here's some ways. I know, I know we start off the year oftentimes with, with a challenge. And sometimes um, just in the busyness of life and we get caught up so much in, in a certain other um, um, sermon series that sometimes we forget to go back. And so here's, here's some challenges to kind of revisit. Who are the 23 people? in 2023 that you're praying for that you're inviting to the hop um, inviting to church events like women's tea and ohana uh, who are they continue to pray for them continue to bridge the gap for them with your faith ask them how you can be praying for them ask them and then follow up with them in how jesus is answering that prayer you do that and you and i stand in the gap for them Bring them to our Easter services and to our um, hop outreach and, and to our harvest festivals. Bring them to church. Last week, Pastor Darrell asked, how might you use your gift in light of God's mercy to serve? It was a great message. You should listen to it. Right? In light of God's mercy to us, how? How can we worship Him? And one of the ways he said is serving. Right? Last week, he asked, how might we use our gifts to serve Him? This week, we're asking, who will you be praying for and standing in the gap for? and bringing closer to the healing Jesus brings by inviting them and praying for them and bringing them up to some of the things that God is doing in our midst. Jesus responds to the faith of believers who stand in the gap and help connect and bring others to Jesus himself. Well, some of us might be thinking like, okay, I believe, but what about my unbelief? What about doubt? What do I, what, what, what do, I do with those things? right and, and, and can we all be honest here we all have doubt we all have doubt right um, the thing to be cautious and very concerned about and, and, and careful that we don't slip into is unbelief thomas doubted and jesus did something with that doubt jesus said there's a healthy way to deal with that doubt we we shouldn't be fearful of doubting we are finite beings trying to understand and connect with an infinite god and so we will naturally have questions here's the things we shouldn't do we shouldn't we, we shouldn't ignore our doubt we shouldn't hide it and, and and suppress it um we should be honest with it one one of the things that we like to say here is um, bring your questions god is big he can handle it he can he honestly can. And, and the questions that you have aren't questions that haven't been asked in the past. Okay? So, so oftentimes when it comes to doubt, we often shun it in Christian circles. So, sometimes it's frowned upon or even condemned. And it, it, it bubbles up within us um, feelings of guilt. Like, what do I do with this? Um, the, the doubt, if not dealt with in a, in, a, in a healthy way, can pull us apart and pull us further away from God. But, but, but I want to throw out this question. What if God wants to use your doubt in mind in a way that it doesn't lead backwards toward unbelief, but instead leads us forward into a deeper faith and a deeper belief and a deeper trust in Him? And so one of the things um, we need to do is to look at how God wants to use our doubt, how we can, how we can take the doubt that we have and, and, and move it in a direction where the result is deeper faith and deeper belief. How do we do that? How do we move from doubt to deeper belief? One author um, lays out four, four helpful, I believe for all of us, four helpful ways that we can do that. And here's the first. First one is this, seek to learn and not to challenge. Seek to, when you have doubt, seek to learn and not to challenge. Um, oftentimes when we ask questions in order to challenge, rather than to learn, we are on the track toward unbelief. We're on the track backwards, right? Rather, 
Use your questions, questions of doubt that you might have, not to challenge and go backwards, but to learn. Here, here's the illustration um, that might be helpful. Uh, when, when there's a courtroom scene, we see a prosecutor who's asking questions of a witness. He does so not to learn something, but rather he, he's asking to disprove um, the witness. He's asking to disprove something to make his point. He has the answers already. The prosecutor already knows what the answers are and he is challenging the witness. And, and this attitude, if we have that toward God, it'll move us with our doubts toward becoming a person of unbelief. It, it puts God on the witness stand and it treats God as if he owes us answers and we have the authority. But, but that's not how we are to come with our questions of doubt. Rather, rather think of this picture. The, the, the picture is more like a young child um, who asks their parents questions, right? Remember when you as a young child and you ask your parents questions, they knew all the answers. And you would just trust in their ability to answer your questions. Um, you would just sit at their feet, seeking to learn and seeking to understand. And, and, and that's the picture of what childlike faith is. Jesus responds to childlike faith. It's a good example of how we can move with our, our doubt, our questions, not toward unbelief, but more toward a deeper faith and belief. Here's the second thing we can do. We can go to the Word and we can go to God's Word with our questions. Right? Go to Jesus. The word pray about those questions that you have those doubting questions that you have pray pray to Jesus and, and let the Holy Spirit speak to you about that and, and then go to God's Word Not, don't just go to Jesus the Living Word go to God's Holy Word right because God's Spirit will not tell you something or inform you some of something and bring clarity to something that is in contrast or conflict with what his word says. You know, a lot of times when we have questions, um, we'll go to everyone but Jesus and everywhere but God's word, right? Um, we will often, when we slip into this um, place where we have questions, we'll ask experts, we'll go to friends, um, we'll hide our doubts and, and and we'll go to, to seek in reading other sources of literature. Um, and, and that is not helpful for our doubts. Uh, sometimes it can be when we go to friends who are well knowledge in the Word, who, who know God's Word well. Um, and so some of those things can help us, right? But, but what is most helpful is to go to Jesus first in prayer and then go to God's holy word to let God's scripture sort those things out for us. Sometimes um, out of arrogance, we turn away from the scriptures. Um, we ignore the fact that, that the scriptures are inspired by God. Every single word is in, inspired by God and, and that it holds everything we need to thrive in life. To overcome the battles that we we encounter spiritually and, and so um, remember that 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 Jesus can deal with doubts as long as we go to him first and we go to his word to sort those things out all right next thing we see is this <clears throat> when we have doubt we need to trust God's character and that will move us to a deeper faith and belief. And we need to resist questioning God's character. Because questioning God's character will lead us to unbelief. Doubt that leads to unbelief will question God's character. Because he is beyond our understanding. Right? I don't get God. Um, and so I question him. I don't understand everything about him right now. And in this moment, and so I'm going to question his character. I don't, I don't understand how he answered this prayer in this way, or why he's not answering prayers in a certain way that I want him to. Um, I'm, I'm, I, 
I question if he really loves me. I question whether or not he really cares for me. And that moves us, friends, into a place of unbelief. But if we trust God's character, like the woman did, that he is compassionate, right? That he is all-powerful. If we trust God's character that he is all-wise and all-loving, if we trust God's character that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, right? Then that moves us, you and I, toward a deeper faith and trust in him. When we, you and I, are befuddled, when we are um, not able to make sense in our human wisdom, um, do we see that as an opportunity or a reason to not trust God? Or do we see it as evidence that God is totally trustworthy? That, that because of his character and his great love for me, that I can trust what's going on even though I don't fully understand why things are playing out the way they are. Believing doubt, a, a doubt that moves us closer to believing, says this, that, that even though I cannot see how God is working things out in this, I trust his character to be doing so. Number four, when we have doubt, something that will help us move toward deeper faith and deeper belief is to trust God's will and not our own. We trust God's will and not our own. Adam and Eve in the garden were the original ones who doubted and chose not to believe God's will. God tells them what will be good for them. God tells them how to live and how to thrive in their relationship with Him. God tells them not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because if you do, you will certainly die. And they didn't. And instead of trusting God's will, they trusted their own will. Christ, the second Adam, sets an example for us on how to trust God's will. Um, he does so when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. In his moment of greatest uncertainty, in the face of his biggest fears, he says, God, if there's another way that this can work out, it would be great for that to happen. But then he says these words, but not my will, God, yours be done. He subjects himself, he yields himself to God's perfect will. Why? Because he trusts God's perfect character, right? And in doing so, in doing so, God is glorified. We'll not always get clear answers on what we're asking for. But God will always hear us and respond to us. He'll give us what is best and what we need. And on top of that example, the work of Christ gives us his assurance that God will never leave us nor forsake us. We trust in God's plan that nothing can separate us from Christ. You know, um, a sermon like this begs the questions that when we come to the Lord, um, that, that we recognize that He has the sovereignty and the wisdom and perfect love for us to answer our prayers in any way He wants. Sometimes He'll say yes instantaneously, miraculously. Um, the resolution for our problems and circumstances um, appears right away. Sometimes he says yes. Sometimes he says yes, but not now. Further down the line, um, the answer will come. But not now. It's a yes, but not now. Right? Sometimes he says yes, but not now. And not in the way that you think. Not in the way that you think. On the flip side of that same coin, sometimes he says no. Not now, but not forever. Right? Um, he'll say no, but down the line, things will change. Um, but just no for now. Sometimes he says no definitely. And sometimes he says no because he wants to answer it in a way that in his perfect wisdom is above and beyond what we could hope for, dream for, or think is good and best. Right? 
and we we need to trust in his will and his character when that happens right we need to press on knowing that his will his will is best for us all right as we close what is the kind of faith that god responds to that jesus responds to a faith that is humble that knows that god owes us nothing a faith that um that is desperate that realizes that that there are things above and beyond our ability to fix, to cure, to heal, to defeat. And we need God's hand in it. Uh, a faith that, does, that knows that God doesn't owe us. And a faith that, that knows that, that Jesus is stronger. Jesus is able. But also a faith that, that stands in the gap for others. Right? And um, ultimately, I think the author of Hebrews... Um, says it best, sums it up best. Um, it says, he says this, it is impossible to please God without faith. For anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists. God exists, that God is real. He is faithful. He is loving. He is all powerful. He is compassionate and merciful. And that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Other, other um, translation says, he rewards those who, who diligently, seek him what is the reward the reward is god himself that as we diligently seek god god gives us himself he gives us his presence he gives us his salvation he gives us knowledge of him he gives us his power he gives us his holiness he gives us pardon he gives us himself a relationship with himself if you've not trusted god for his forgiveness and his mercy and his compassion made only available through his son. Contact us. Contact us at info at hillsideoc.com or info at lifesongcc.com. We'd love, we'd love to let you know how you can do that. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we give you thanks that you are a God who responds to our faith. And uh, God, we thank you for these passages that show us a little bit more of the kind of faith that you respond to. And God, I pray that we would see ourselves rightly as the creatures and you as the creator, you with all dignity, we with all despair and desperateness, that we would come to you, Lord, knowing, knowing your character, that you are all powerful, merciful and forgiving, and one who desires us to know you personally because of the work of your son. We pray these things in your son's name and all God's people said, amen. Thanks everybody. We'll see you again next week. God bless.